So I'll start off with a case also. So this is a 34-year-old pregnant lady. The fetal echo at uh, age, age 18 uh, weeks of pregnancy shows some abnormality, likely a univentricular heart, severe pulmonary stenosis, possibly atresia. At that early uh, time of pregnancy, it's sometimes very difficult to know exactly the anatomy. Um, there is total anomalous pulmonary venous return. And then a repeat echo uh, at uh, 24 weeks shows obstructed infradiaphragmatic total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So we knew right before the baby comes out that there will be an early need for intervention. It is also pulmonary stenosis or atresia that would need uh, something, an augmented source of pulmonary blood flow for the circulation. So uh, the par parents were counseled and the plan for delivery and surgery was made. And that's again, as a, a planning team as, as has been mentioned by Dr. Phillips before. And the uh, patient was delivered in the specialized uh, uh, delivery unit that we have. We planned the C-section at 9 a.m. specifically on a Monday morning. We had confirmed the diagnosis at 10 a.m. The baby was in the operating table at 12 a.m. Now, we, at this, this baby was thought that can survive for the first few hours of life, and we did the open heart surgery uh, effectively three hours after the baby was born. Uh, there might be a need sometimes that we actually think that the baby will not survive the first few hours and need to exit to ECMO as has been cited before by Dr. Uh, Cass and Dr. Phillips before. So uh, from my perspective as a surgeon, a, a, a cardiac surgeon, what do I need to know and when do I get, get, need to get involved with the critically ill newborn? And I, I would like to get involved with them on the first diagnosis of fetal echo. Once we have this, we need to discuss, we need to talk to the family and then decide what are we going to do? Or are we going to need be needed right in the first few hours of life, or in the first few weeks of life, or maybe later on that we counsel the family? The areas that we need to decide about: do we need to do a surgical intervention, cath intervention, or just pharmacologic intervention to avoid either death or end organ damage? The last thing you want is to have a patient, a baby who is born, to have a cardiac arrest and then revived and then brought to surgery. Uh, in all the studies that looked at this, a preoperative cardiac arrest always has a detrimental effect and will not lead to a good outcome in, in heart surgery, and that's why. So we need to identify those with high-risk hypoplastic lift heart, pomeotresias, tetrarchy of flow, severe ones, obviously, total normal sperm and venous return, transpositions, tricuspid arteries, and truncus arteriosus. These are the, the, the ones we need to get involved with early in the first a few hours, possibly a few days after birth. So we need to do a, pre, a prenatal evaluation. We've talked this, we heard about this from uh, Dr. Ehrenberg also and, and uh, Dr. Chapa. And initial neonatal evaluation and management that has been done by early by the cardiologist to confirm the diagnosis and we decide. And then we have a, a, a stabilization time and transportation if the baby was born in a non-heart uh, surgery center. And that is important because this is an area of vulnerability that the baby can actually can have a cardiac arrest and not infrequently sometimes we get a baby that transferred from another hospital in sometimes desperate conditions before we stabilize them to get them to have surgery. We confirm the diagnosis when they get to us, and then we have a preoptive evaluation for non-cardiac organ, non organ system. And this really is important uh, because not infrequently there are other non-cardiac lesions that will affect the cardiac intervention, not only the outcome in general, but can affect the type of surgery that we do, whether we do a palliative and a, or a, a non-palliative procedure, we do an extensive or a less uh, extensive procedure. All these have to be determined early. The timing and the type of surgery and then the lesion specific management that needs to be done. As I was mentioning, you need to go through the obstetric history, you need to do the genetics. The genetics may impact. So the last thing also you want is you do a very complex successful cardiac operation only to find that the there is a genetic syndrome with a survival 
uh, rate of uh, five or ten percent after the first year of life. Uh, you've you've uh, you've had to put this into the equation. So you need to know exactly what what all the other genetic abnormalities there they are. Um, and the prenatal uh, ultrasound and echocardiography, as we've talked about. Unfortunately, we still are getting patients who have not been diagnosed by a fetal echo. And this is just a distribution of who, who they are. And we need to improve on that. I think within the United States as well, I'm sure the rest of the world, we need to work on that. The good thing about it is that the majority of them, when they are diagnosed, the likelihood is that you're going to get either the same diagnosis in 60% of them or even a better diagnosis. So they could be actually less severe as built before. Sometimes they are worse, but uh, it's always better to call them more severe uh, lesion rather than less severe lesion and then have, have to mess what you can do for them. The initial evaluation needs obviously the usual stuff, uh, the stuff we do, which is the pre and post ductal saturations. And you want to know whether it's the right and left of the heart. Are they communicating well, or are they in series, or are they parallel, or uh, there is a shunt enough between them or not? And that can be uh, systematically looking at where the uh, uh, duct the flow through the ductus arterios. Is it right to left or is it left to right? And then you decide where is the areas. If there are problems with the left side of the heart, the chances is that the right side will take over and uh, shunt right to left, and you'll have a differential uh, cyanosis. If you have the other way around, then you'll have the reversal of the shunt, and this is where you need to augment the primary blood flow. Echocardiography and cardiac catheterization can be done uh, early to confirm the diagnosis. And then, as I said, sort out the genetic, the CNS, and the renal abnormalities that can be seen in, 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 in uh, conjunction with cardiac uh, abnormality. Uh, stabilization and transportation. Uh, uh, since prostaglandin has been introduced in a congenital heart disease, uh, a lot of cardiac, congenital cardiac surgeons actually slipped the nights because before that they had to go in and operate on those patients, unfortunately, not with a great outcome. Prostaglandins to uh, preserve the ductus flow, whether it's uh, right to left or left to right. And then it's important to know that uh, these patients are used to also cyanosis, so you don't have to push the patient with putting them on oxygen because that can drop the pulmonary vascular resistance and can change the outlook of those patients because of the uh, steel phenomena that you see that we see sometimes with lower pulmonary vascular disease uh, resistance that will steal the circulation from the systemic and then they get into acidosis and lower heart function and then sometimes cardiac arrest and, and shock before they get to uh, proper repair. So it's really, it's important to uh, use uh, pressors and, and oxygen judiciously on those because if you increase the SVR, the likelihood is that you're gonna have more flow to the pulmonary circulation. Uh, so, uh, looking at the lesion-specific management, uh, ductile-dependent for primary blood flow or ductile-dependent for systemic blood flow. So, if you have an obstruction in the uh, left side and aortic stenosis and interrupted aortic or severe coarctation, you need to uh, continue to have flow to the, le to the rest of the body for, for that. Uh, these are the lesions that you need to look at. Is, is you worried about lung flow or body flow? and then decide based on that, what do you wanna do subsequently uh, when planning for the next uh, intervention? And that can be uh, clearly uh, uh, decided upon, uh, not all the time with 100% confidence, because sometimes there are some hypoplasia of one side of the heart or, or the other side that will give us some doubt as to the adequacy of that side of the heart, whether it's left or right, and it's sometimes not so easy to decide that that uh, half of the heart is adequate for uh, a full cardiac output. Another case scenario uh, is a, a three-week uh, old uh, baby was born with tetralogy of fellow and starting what we call uh, tetralogy spells. That means the right ventricular outflow tract is, is contracting and allowing more blood going through the VSD into the systemic circulation and less blood going to the lungs. So they are what we call spelling. They get persistent metabolic acidosis and lactic acidemia. So the usual sedation is all uh, medical. These are the different parts and, 
Uh, this is usually well handled by the cardiologist and the intensivist. And uh, usually we do not have to do an urgent surgery for that. Having said that, after you stabilize, we need to decide this is a, is a, a repair needed at that time, or actually we can stabilize them and send them home after this. This is still a, a debate, and the debate is live. There are, until today, centers who would prefer palliation versus uh, centers who would do, who would uh, uh, prefer uh, repair. Our center is we, we do prefer a, a, a neonatal repair of tetralogy fellow, regardless of what uh, uh, their pre, uh, um, uh, status of uh, uh, the anatomy, except for those patients who have uh, uh, aortopulmonary collaterals and need unifocalizations, these can, these can be staged. And we can talk a little bit about staged procedures later on. And it is important that tetralogy of follow up. Um, can I go back on this one? Yeah. So the tetralogy of follow comes in with multiple uh, uh, different. Uh, uh, spectrums, and it's important to know not every one is the same as the other, and we need to gauge this, and that's what the case conference is all about when we sit around with the cardiologists and surgeons and intensivists and anesthetists and decide what we need to do. And when we decide it is important to add palliative procedures has a morbidity as well as a mortality. Correct, uh, complete repair has also a morbidity and a mortality. If you see from the STS here, the shunt mortality is anywhere between 5 and 13 percent. And you see in the last column, um, complete repair is anywhere between 0 and 7.8 percent. So there is a variations in that. But in between, there is actually an RVOT stent and there is a ductal stent. And there are two procedures as opposed to one complete repair procedure. So the centers with high reliability would have the ability to do a full repair with good outcome. And that's what we are strive to do all the time. And we have an algorithm to decide which babies we would, we would take them through a full repair versus a palliation uh, as, uh, as we go along. And in general, most of the time, it is the palliation is uh, reserved for those uh, babies with other non-cardiac lesion that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, systemic uh, flow obstruction, um, uh, this has been alluded to. Uh, the management of, with, uh, to, with, by Dr. Ehrenberg with the hypoplastic lift heart. So we need to make sure that make keep that duct open. And uh, we have to make sure that they are. Sometimes we may need to do urgent surgeries if that duct uh, doesn't open or is not kept open for, for perfusion. So systemic flow obstruction, um, if the coarctation, if it is a coarctation, then combined with intercardiac lesion, then the repair can be staged uh, with uh, complete, uh, with st can be either staged or complete taking into the account all the other factors, the non-cardiac lesions, the uh, age, the body weight, all the other factors that we take into the uh, uh, equ equation when we decide the repair. Critical aortic stenosis either can be done in the cath lab or surgery. We have a bias to go more for surgery unless they are really suitable and they are tri-leaflet valves, and they can be done in the cath lab with a, with a balloon dilatation of the aortic valve. And then uh, subsequently, if they need surgery uh, done uh, later on, or we could do neo neonatal pulmonary valvotomy, aortic valvotomy. Other forms of obstruction, like uh, uh, obstructed cortratiatum, if it is so, then it needs surgery urgently within the first few days of life, obstructed TAPVD, as we alluded to, as well as the Schoen's complex variants. These are all come with uh, the same consideration that you have to evaluate and operate on them in the first uh, few days of life after birth. Sometimes the restriction uh, of primary blood flow comes in, in different areas uh, that is needed. So this, these are patients with unrestricted pulmonary flow that you need to restrict them, and th that means they need the pulmonary artery band. These are the, some of the indications for pulmonary artery band to deal with them right after birth uh, because uh, you have an unrestricted pulmonary blood flow. Very rarely that we have with two ventricles where we, uh, we need to do this. Most of the time we reserve this to univentricular heart. Uh, restrictive atrial septa needs to be taken out and restrictive ventricular septa needs to be out. In the last uh, two slides, when do we call for ECMO? Uh, reality is uh, you call it when you need it, when you're in a desperate situation, hemodynamic instability, high inotropic uh, score, uh, as well as persistent metabolic acidemia, as well as the inability to oxygenate or ventilate. 
These ECMOs can be venoarterial ECMO or can be venovenous ECMO, depending on what the need is. And these are temporary. And if we need something that uh, is uh, long term, then we use a Berlin heart, which can be used for one ventricle or for both ventricles, and they can be left. Um, until heart transplantation or as a bridge to transplantation. And obviously the last resort is to do heart transplantation with whatever is uh, uh, required with it. There's a long waiting list for that. Uh, we have great out outcomes with, the, with heart transplantation, limited donor availability, and there are some issues of long-term immunosuppression. So the take, uh, the take away message is the surgeon should be involved early in the management of the critically ill neonate. The timing of surgery is dependent on the lesion expertise, lesion itself, expertise, and the comorbidities, of, comorbidities in the baby. Sick neonates may give only a short window for intervention, and we cannot lose that window. Palliative procedures or corrective surgery is dependent on lesions and expertise and comorbid conditions. Thank you.